Any questions for Tim? For Nick. Well, thanks very much. See you later. <laughs>
it's uh, it's kind of an interesting book in that you could take the entire concept and learn how to learn how to use it from the ground up, but you could also just use it as a, a reference, I think, um, to find things that you may not have found before uh, doing your typical uh, exercises for learning music. So, um, do you have anything to say about it, Mick? About um, how you created the concept? No, not really. Actually, uh, I think it's explained in the kind of the appendix of the back of the book. It kind of goes through a 12-page uh, discussion of how I did kind of discover it. So rather than repeat that, you can just buy the book and read it yourself. Well, I'll answer that for myself, and we'll see what Mick has to say. But um, for me, it's all about knowing the piece well enough um, to where I, I, I just can hear it in my head. I know what the bass note sounds like. Not, I'm not just thinking it, you know, like the names of the chords or something like that. I know what it sounds like in my head. So I'm, I'm sort of listening to that inside my brain. <laughs> um, it, but that only comes from knowing it well enough. So I, I have to play a song you know, hundreds, thousands of times in order to get that to where it's almost this just organic thing that's happening. I'm just hearing it and playing it and I don't have to think about what the chords are, what the melody is. But that takes a lot of practice. That's not just something that happens right away. It takes a lot of playing. So once that's established, then it's just all about listening to the other person. And in this case, Mick, Everything that he played to my ear was describing the harmony. So the, the melodic lines that he was playing sounded like the chords to me. So I know the chords, I'm listening to him at the same time, he's describing it, so I feel like we're both on the same page. But I think, I think the real answer is knowing a tune well enough and, and uh, really opening up your ears. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> uh, when I first start with a new student, I give them a list of standard tunes from the real book and say, uh, we're going to work on a new tune every week. And uh, I have them learn how to play bass lines against the tune as well as soloing against the tune. And we kind of alternate. In other words, they'll, they'll solo first. I will play, if it's a swing tune, a broken two-feel bass line for one chorus. Then we switch functions, all solo, they'll play a broken two-feel bass line. Then on the third chorus, we switch again, they solo, I will play a walking bass line, and then we switch again. So it's basically four choruses. I don't let them play chords too much. And I certainly don't let them play bass lines and chords at the same time, uh, unless they're really, really, really advanced, and even then, I don't like that sound so much. And I have found that uh, being able to play a really intelligent bass line is a really, really good way of learning the changes to the tune. Uh, I had a flute player once uh, when I was still teaching at uh, NEC. And he was a senior, and somehow or other, he got scheduled to study with me. So we got together for a lesson, and uh, I said, let's play a tune. What do you want to play? He said, uh, how about all the things you are? I said, sure. So he soloed. He played very well. He took a couple courses, then he stopped, and I started soloing, and I played four measures, and then I stopped, and I said, why don't you comp for me? He said, what? I said, why don't you comp for me, play a bass line or something? He says, I never learned how to do that. And I said, well, learn. So he came back two weeks later, and uh, I said, did you learn how to do that? And he said, yeah, I did. So we did the same thing. We're playing the same tune. He soloed, he sounded good. Then when he was finished, he started playing a little bass line, which sounds a little funny on a flute. But was able to negotiate through the changes very well. So we finished, and I said, so tell me what you learned from that. 
He says, you know, I've been playing for quite a long time and I know my chord scales and understand harmony, but it was not until I actually had to go through the process of putting together an intelligent bass line, I really think I understand harmony much better than ever before. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is we constantly need to remind ourselves how incredibly complicated this instrument is. Uh, if you hear two saxophone players talking about alternate fingerings and the difficulties that they have and that they may be able to play one note in three different places, you'll just kind of, uh, what except for low E on the guitar does not have alternate fingerings in alternate locations, right? It's just, that's why it takes so long to really get very, very familiar with it. So for young people, I think it's very important to have patience and realize you're dealing with something that's uh, very, very complicated, but that over decades and decades, you'll eventually get so that you kind of know where everything is, hopefully. An accurate description of the harmony. For me, that's the answer. That's pretty good. Listen to good bass players, then you'll, you'll recognize it when you hear it. When you, before you get into kind of seriously learning how to play intelligent bass lines, your view of a bass player is like, well, okay, they're down there doing that, and I'm up here doing this thing. But once you start trying to learn how to play it, then you begin to notice what bass players are doing, uh, and your ear becomes a little bit more uh, interested and intelligent about, oh, what an interesting way to go through that series of chords. I would have never thought of doing that. So, um, yeah, you have to, uh, there's also the other thing too, the difference between, in a swing feel, what we call a broken two feel, and the walking bass line. Walking bass line is primarily quarter notes. The broken two feel is primarily half notes, but there's other stuff there too. And the broken two feel, this is something that I kind of ascertained from my time with Steve Swallow, who's one of the masters of that feel, is one of the most creative things in the music that we play. And you would think, well, a bass line can't be that creative. But the broken two feel uh, is really good because you can, as playing the bass, you can sort of shape your rhythms and so forth to accommodate what the soloist is doing and, in fact, carry on a conversation with it. So you can do that, too, with a walking bass line, but not quite so easily. So uh, that, that's definitely a feel to, to look into exploring. Steve Swallow. But there are a lot of other great players that can play broken two field very nicely. Just adding to that, um, one thing that I did uh, is just take a few of my favorite tunes and just learn parts of the bass line of the tune. So, you know, I would listen to a great recording and just say, I wonder, I kind of wonder what you know, so-and-so is playing over this 251 or over this major chord or, you know, some sort of specific part in the tune. And then I would actually just learn it, just note for note, just to see, just to kind of step into the shoes of that person for a minute and say, how is he doing that, you know? Um, because I didn't know. <laughs> um, I was kind of asking the same question that you're asking. So I think sometimes a, a, a good way to do it is go directly to the source and research the source and say, what's happening here? Learn it, learn from it, and then maybe you can find something of your own based on the concept that you learned from that. So that might be a good, good thing for you to do. You learn some vocabulary, you know, get some vocabulary together, how to approach major chords, how to approach dominant chords, how to approach a 2-5-1 or a 3-6-2-5, or, you know, common progressions. It can be really helpful, at least it was for me. Uh, I think a real w simple way to look at this is um, what we call melody 
is sort of the science of essentially one note at a time, okay? If we think of harmony usually as beginning with sort of the science of three or more notes at a time, you know, like in triads or seven chords, whatever. So the question is, what is two notes at a time? Now, two notes at a time probably you could call counterpoint. Counterpoint meaning point against point or note against note, but also melody against melody. So uh, I remember when I was 16, uh, my parents got me a, a Les Paul solid body, which was the best guitar I'd ever had up until that time. And it had uh, you know two pickups and a toggle switch. And it said, in this position, it said lead. And then in the upper, upper position, it said rhythm. And I was always curious, what do they call the one in the middle? I guess that would be counterpoint, you know. Uh, but I think that's a simple way of, of, of looking at it. Counterpoint is, it's the study of intervals. It's the study of two melodies, at least, at the same time. But the study of intervals is so important because you can have a melodic interval or you can have a harmonic interval. So in a way, counterpoint helps your uh, understanding of melody better and also harmony, plus it's its own little thing, too. Does that make any sense? I hope so. Yeah, I think I do. Um, I think I think that comes down to, uh, for me, um, being able to hear the interval and know what it looks like on the instrument at the same time. So, being able to visualize. I mean, because the you know the the guitar is a visual instrument. So I, for me, I I like to use that to my advantage not think of it as a, a disadvantage because it can be you could think of it both ways really I would think of it as a major advantage so I want to try to find some connection between my ear and the visual interval on the guitar so if I you know if I I know that duh, it's gonna be that right so in my head uh, I know, usually, <laughs> hopefully, what it's going to sound like before I play it um, on a good day, you know. Uh, and if you can develop that, seeing it, hearing it, playing it, or you know, different orders of that, I think that will lead to where you're, you're looking to go. And also being able to name them, I think that's important too. You just kind of knowing that's a fourth or that's a third. But the hearing thing for me is just the the big thing. And I actually find that um, it's the the thing that I have to talk to my students about the most. It's like, well, are you are you hearing and singing what you're playing in your head, or are you just thinking that and just sticking your fingers on the guitar? For me, I'm always trying to develop the sort of inner ear in myself and help my students to develop that because I think it's a real secret to learning how to improvise well, making those connections. So one thing that you can practice really specifically to get this happening is uh, singing everything that you play, uh, whether it be out loud or internally or humming it or whatever you want to do, singing everything that you play for at least two or three years. <laughs> In, in your practice. And uh, I think you might find that if you do that, you'll develop things that you didn't really realize existed. I kind of knew what I wanted to do before I did it. I think that kind of is true about a lot of things with music. You know, I kind of know what I want, and even now I kind of know what I want to do, even though I it's kind of abstract in my head, but I kind of know what it is, and, and I, I feel it. I just have to figure out ways of getting to it, so that's, then I have to go into exploratory mode, where I start to dig 
I have to just start digging inside of myself, not externally, because you can only get, from your influences, you can only get so much, you know. But after a while, you just have to start digging inside of yourself to say, what is that thing that I'm hearing sort of in an abstract way, and how do I make that come out? And uh, that takes a lot of thought and a lot of um, uh, time, time by yourself thinking, really, you know, and uh, exploring the instrument to see if you're getting there playing and recording yourself. Is that it? You know, is that it? You know, composing things that sound like that abstract thing in your head. You know, this is what creates your sound, I think, ultimately. I think uh, <clears throat> you have to uh, spend a lot of time, as Tim's talking about, listening to different types of music that you're attracted to, um, doing research in terms of perhaps reading about different players, seeing who they played with. Uh, and that has to go on pretty intensely for quite a long time, along with, of course, practicing and playing you know, with as uh, many good musicians as you can. But I think there's a certain point that most of us get to where you kind of see what it is and you kind of don't need to listen so much to keep up. In other words, you kind of, maybe in a way, you're a little bit going into your own individual kind of cave to really okay, now let's spend the next 30 years finding the stuff that I want to do. You don't need to depend as much on outside sources. It doesn't mean that you're completely oblivious to it, but you don't depend on it so much. You kind of become a law unto yourself. Uh, and there's something about that that's, I wouldn't say it's lonely, but you're alone. You know, you, you decide what things you want to pursue you have to make decisions about, okay, this doesn't seem to be working, so let me drop that for a while and do something else. It's pretty tricky, but you can develop a, a tolerance for it, let's say. I remember uh, uh, talking to Jerry Bugonzi, a saxophone player, who's one of my favorite players, who I used to play with quite a bit. And before we were gonna play a set, he just commented, he says, you know, it's getting to the point when the work that I do on my own learning process is becoming just as interesting as the actual music that is coming out from it. And I nodded and said, yeah, that really seems to be the way it is, isn't it? It's a very interesting process to study yourself doing the same thing over a very long period of time. And hopefully, you will have a long period of time. Um, when I was a student here at Berkeley back in 1963, uh, John Abercrombie was also there and became a very good friend of mine. So his birthday is on December. I always call him to wish him happy birthday. And last December, I called him and uh, he said that he had just seen Jim Hall's 82nd birthday where Jim played. I said, how did he sound? Because Jim Hall was a uh, very big influence on both of us. And John said, he sounded fine, but he hardly plays melodies anymore. He's playing mostly chords. And I said, isn't that interesting? Uh, maybe that's what he wanted to do all along, but it took him 60 years to get there. So you never know. And I think, too, that should help all, all of us remember that sometimes doing something for a very long time kind of helps keep you young. I mean, if Jim Hall at 82 is still continuing to develop and involve, I think there's, you know, we should all feel pretty good about our chances of doing that, too. So there. Thank you. 
What type of emotions do we try to evoke or capture? Music is a flow for me, so it's like a life flow. So kind of whatever I'm feeling or whatever I'm doing is just, that's what's happening in the music. So I'm not trying to capture anything. I think it's just a part of who I am and the way I live. And so when I'm playing, I'm living and when I'm living, I'm, I don't, <laughs> it's just flow, man, it's an organic thing. So I'm not trying to capture anything. Uh, I can't do that. I have to just play and, and uh, be in the moment. And, and maybe at that moment, I'm feeling a certain way and that uh, the music goes there. Compose music with anything specific in mind? My best tunes come to me when I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just in the flow. So usually, no, not for me. I don't know about Mick. Um, 
I don't consider myself a composer. Uh, I compose, but I don't consider myself a composer. I'm primarily instrumentalist, improviser. Uh, but my experience in composing, uh, sometimes there's a necessity to compose. Maybe something is going on in my life whereby I need to express it a certain way. Uh, it could be something that's going well in my life or something that's not going so well in my life. You know, we do have the blues, don't we? Uh, and I have found that if that's the case, I usually have a window of about two or three days where I have to get the main stuff to whatever the piece is going to be done. Because it's all still kind of fresh for that window. Um, that's one kind of composing. That's kind of like composition out of necessity. Um, for me, there are other things that happen very spontaneously in the course of practicing or playing, whereby maybe it will be, it could be just a, a melodic thing that kind of gets my attention, but more often than not, it could be a progression, maybe two chords or maybe even three. Um, for instance. Even that, that's kind of like, that was two days work, but that was enough to get me going to get a whole piece out of that. Um, sometimes, for me, I, I have a very kind of mathematical approach to music some of the time, which works well for me. It could be in the form of a question. For instance, uh, a long time ago, I, was, I had a question of, what would it sound like if I took cycle three root progression through a major scale, just going up in thirds, C, E, G, B, D, F, A. But instead of it being all the diatonic triads of the key of C, how about if they were all minor triads? That was my question. Now, that's not something that I can hear in my head, so I had to go to the guitar and say, okay, let's see what that's gonna be. C minor, okay, E minor, and try to voice lead it, okay, up to G minor, okay, B minor, just checking my voice leading, D minor, F minor, A minor. Now, I can't remember what that sounds like. I mean, did that sound okay? I don't know, the first time, right? I'm just trying to fit that. So, and I say, wait a minute, what's that last three? D minor, F minor, A minor. That sounds familiar. Where have I heard that before? And then, of course, oh, it's just B minor 7 flat 5, E augmented 7 with a flat 9 to A minor. So then I get the idea, how about if I put the whole progression over an A pedal, because that's where it's going to end. So I go, again, from the beginning, C minor, E minor, G minor, B minor, and then D minor. So without going into a whole song and dance, eventually I did a, another version of it where I opened the triad so that they were, you know, a little more wide. And uh, eventually added some melodic embellishment, and that ended up being a nice little 16 bars of music. So for me, sometimes it's just natural curiosity, whereby I want to explore something that I haven't played before. Now, even if I don't necessarily get a whole tune or a piece out of it, I'll end up knowing the material better, and I will end up knowing the instrument better. So it's always worthwhile pursuing that. So those are kind of my modes of composition. I think we have time for one more question. It's a really interesting question. A lot of interesting questions today. You guys are great. Um, no, I'm not thinking ahead. I'm in the moment of, I'm, I'm in the moment. So, I, I mean, maybe, maybe a bar ahead, you know, if I'm not as familiar with the tune or, you know, if I'm reading or something like that, I might have to kind of look ahead or, you know, compare prepare for something, but if I know the tune really well, I personally am not looking ahead, I'm just in the moment of each melody note or, or chord. 
I think, think some, of, some of it depends on tempo. I think some of the time, if you're playing fast, you have to kind of think ahead. You have to move the time uh, in more compact units because they're going by so quick. Um, I know my friend John Abercrombie once said something really interesting. He's talking about a particular way of playing. And he said, well, I know I'm going to start here. And I have a feeling they're going to end here, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. So that indicates that there's at least the possibility with him of some kind of looking ahead. Um, I think sometimes you have to be careful about this kind of thing, being concerned about looking ahead too much. Maybe it might even be more interesting to introduce more space in your playing, see what happens in your mind in terms of what you hear or think you want to hear, and then experiment with sometimes editing so that you don't play what you hear, or you play it in a different place than what you hear. That might be worthwhile really experimenting with, or maybe not. I guess we're kind of done. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody.